All right, so we get started uh, on the next part of this module. So just to recap, so far we've built the structure of a state-space model. In fact, that's what is due today. Uh, I hope you've already submitted your assignments either uh, in person over here or online as a PDF. There was no programming part. Uh, so we are done with the structure, and in the previous lecture, I kind of gave you an insight into what is energy plus. It essentially uses the same sort of models that we have been discussing, but in a lot more detail. You uh, now have some idea of what that simulator is and uh, how it functions, and more importantly, how does it describe what a building is. Uh, and, and these are the semantics of you know uh, describing schedules and structures and material properties and so on. So um, that introduction to Energy Plus was not just you know some high level intro and now we're done with it. I want I introduced that for a reason. Um, so the next assignment is, is already out. Uh, so don't panic. I know you've been submitting assignments every week. Uh, this one you have a little bit more time. Okay? So it's not due uh, next Thursday. It's due on in one and a half weeks. So maybe, uh, three lectures from now rather than the usual two lectures. Uh, in fact, I want to really emphasize that because uh, uh, when you grab a hard copy, the due date written here is incorrect. It's for the next week, but it's not. Okay, I'm giving you uh, another weekend. So you have two weekends basically to complete this. Uh, what is this assignment about? It has, uh, you know, uh, also this assignment is a little bit, uh, you know, it's formal for like a booklet. It's ten pages, but most of the the pages are just like a tutorial. For, for you to understand what you're going to do. But let me quickly give you an idea of uh, the two parts that this assignment has. Um, the first part is that you know you submitted a RC network model. Now you have to implement that model in MATLAB. So that's one part of the assignment, that how do you describe a state space model which has ABCD matrices, which are functions of the, of the R and the C values. Uh, how do you just encode that as a function in MATLAB um, that can, you know, given some values of parameters and inputs, it can produce an output Y. Uh, and what will happen is that uh, in the next lecture, uh, which is next week, I will actually share a solution set with you of the assignment that is due today. Okay, so. Everybody has submitted their version of a model, and honestly, the grading of this assignment is also going to be very subjective. So we are looking for mistakes in modeling rather than comparing your solution to some horrible reference solution that I wrote. Because we know, right, by design, that you know all models are wrong. Some are useful. So if someone has you know modeled every internal wall separately, or you know been creative in how they model the floor and the ceilings, it may not be incorrect, but it maybe a mismatch with my reference solution. So that will be a problem going forward because you've all submitted your models, but um, you know you can still you know use that model which you have submitted, so stand by like, your, your submission and tune the parameters of that RC model. But for this assignment, I have uh, given some template code that will help you to encode this state-space model into MATLAB. And all of that code is going to pertain to the template solution that I will release next week. Okay, makes sense? I can't release like 24 different solution templates uh, based on your submission for your RC network. So you have, it's your choice if you want to stick with your model or use the reference uh, RC network as the example to learn about the parameter estimation, generally the, the whole form. So that's one part. Okay, one part is there will be some template code in MATLAB. Um, uh, maybe if you open it today, it will still make sense, it's very well commented, but you may not know what model it represents, so that would be clear on Tuesday. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give you more time, because you know the solution is only going to be released on Tuesday. Uh, and the second half of this worksheet is what I discussed last time, right? So, uh, where we are at right now is that we have a model and it has a structure which represents a state-space model. But we don't know the values of the coefficients of this model, right? so the parameters, the u's and the c's. So where do they come from? I very briefly touched upon this, that given some real data, you have to actually estimate the values which describe or match real data. Right? So our real data is coming from energy plus, but we treat it as a real data. 
So the starting point for this matching is where energy plus comes in. You have to estimate the nominal values of the parameters. Right? So you have to estimate the nominal values from the IDF file. So you have to go back, look at the external wall or every surface, every window, look at the layers in the window, estimate the thermal mass where it makes sense, the conductivity where it makes sense, so we've covered all of that. So you do have to you know, sit down and spend some time looking at IDF. You are not done with energy plus yet. And then there's some even extra credit part if you can actually run Energy Plus, whether you use the built-in tool or the native application on your OS, doesn't matter. Uh, I have some questions on, you know, how would you change a schedule and that something, and you'll read about it in the, in the worksheet. So it's a very interesting worksheet. This will lay the, the foundational piece for us to do the last part. And there's only one more worksheet after worksheet three in this module where you will actually tune your model to match your quality. Okay, very logical progression. So talking about that, that's the going to be the uh, focal point of the next couple of lectures, or I think just two lectures at most, uh, where we will first define and understand this notion of parameter estimation. So if you haven't realized this already, the way I like to teach concepts is I may start from a very general formulation that will apply to any problem that can be express mathematically in that form, and then I draw some analogies with our domain, which is energy and state space for temperature prediction. And so you will see a lot of that in this uh, you know, next few uh, lectures, where I'll go in and out of being very, very generalized at high level, and then tying that to how you would use it, and then going back out to a generalized uh, principle of modeling. Okay, so, so, so we have a lot of different things to cover, so starting from a very quick overview of linear regression. I'm very sure many of you don't. Maybe like, can you raise your hand if you have if you know what linear regression is, and even better if you actually implemented that in whatever it goes. So uh, a healthy majority, right? So so I'll give you a very quick overview of linear regression, especially uh, how it pertains to what we are interested in, which is nonlinear regression, and I'll explain why our problem is nonlinear as well. Uh, so we'll start, the, the main sort of, you know, core point over here is uh, uh, we will study non-linear least squares, right? So linear regression usually uses least squares regression and we will study methods of non-linear least squares and then we will actually tie it back to our state space model. In fact, I think we can even reach that point today itself, uh, but I won't rush, so I'll keep the pace, you know, steady. And then the... I'll, we'll close this parameter estimation sort of uh, discussion with the actual implementation, which will really help you with the last worksheet of this module. Okay, so um, so with that said, let's just jump into, the, into a quick overview of what linear regression is, and especially from the point of view of the concepts behind linear regression. I don't really care about the semantics and the methods or you know what programming language you would use to implement that. I want to emphasize a few key properties that we will really leverage when we talk about nonlinear regression. So this is now jumping into a very general discussion. Okay? And uh, let me give a disclaimer, which is very good because uh, this is what I learned from last time I offered this course. It's completely my fault for being lazy that I have abused a lot of notations in this particular lecture and I haven't had the time to fix them yet. What do I mean by that? You know, we have become prototypes of our own thinking when we look at why we associate that with the output, x is the state, u is the input. So just break out of that box for maybe the next 15 minutes because the x's and y's are just going to be changed. Uh, my bad, but not, not according to what our dimension has been. But I'll point out whenever there's any sort of confusion. Okay, so that's my lawyer disclaimer before we jump into this. So, okay. So what is linear regression? Well, let's look at a very simple motivating example. You have a single uh, observed or measured variable, or you can actually think of this as the output y. And y depends upon some variables or some characteristics or states or inputs. It's, everything is valid term terminology at this point, and y depends on x. So the single uh, umbrella term could be that x can predict y. Okay, so x is called a predictor or independent variable in statistics. So you are given some data, and this is what the data looks like. The problem of linear regression is, can you describe a mathematical model that can you know, uh, 
model or predict what would the next value of y be if we give some value of x which is not present in this scatter plot. Okay, so, so everybody knows what that looks like, but let me make a very subtle distinction between how actually linear regression works. So let's say that without revealing to you, I actually wrote this equation in MATLAB or whatever programming language that yi, every value of y is some constant uh, beta naught plus some beta 1 times some value of xi plus I also added some noise, let's say some Gaussian noise it doesn't matter what noise, actually it does matter but let's assume Gaussian noise so, so I implemented this before coming to uh, class and then I chose some random values of x and just gave you the values of y and that's what this scatter plot looks like so what you saw is only the scatter plot. You don't know the true values of what my code used to generate that plot. What is beta naught and beta one? That's only known to me. Okay, so so what you are saying is when we when we model or when we use linear regression, not only are we saying that the output just depends linearly on the input, which is the sort of you know uh, obvious interpretation that everybody knows. What we are really saying is we hypothesize that y is this particular function of x, beta naught plus beta 1. So our task now is, since we don't know the true beta naught and beta 1, we generated this sampling of the uh, you know, true equation, we are going to estimate the values of beta naught and beta 1 using this subset of data. Okay, that's what linear regression is. Let me make it more sort of formal. You observe y i, but you don't know the intercept or the slope of this equation. You only know the data. And you don't even know the random error which was added to generate the data. So what you are doing is, what linear regression is doing is, this, in another terms which makes sense now because we've done this assignment, this is your model structure. This is the RC structure for this state, uh, you know, scatter plot. And you are tasked with now to estimate what, what's the best value of beta naught and beta 1 that describes the measurements that I have observed. So the more measurements you have, the better chance you are to estimate beta naught and beta 1 to its true actual value, which is unknown to you. So in another, world, in another sense, we can say, you know, uh, all of data is not generated by, by people who write code like me in math that will just confuse you. So here's the take home message. In linear regression, we get a uh, output and predictors, and we are assuming our hypothesis is that y is a linear function of x, and our goal is to estimate to our best of our ability, given the observations, what could be the values of beta naught and beta. We can, in fact, and here's the claim, we can never actually get the true value of beta naught and beta from data. Right, you may have to observe infinite data to actually pinpoint this is what you used in your code. But a sampling of what you observe is what we would use to estimate. Right? So how do we say that mathematically? Uh, beta naught and beta 1 are parameters of this linear model that we have hypothesized is the structure of what is behind my observation. We don't know the true values of them, so we will estimate them using data. So how do we do that? Well, we say let me say that the observation, observed response by i, is my estimate of beta naught plus my estimate of beta 1 times the input xi plus some error. Okay? So what you say is that yi is some estimate y prime plus some error. Where y prime has the same form as our assumed model, but we can actually calculate the values of v naught and v1 which try to minimize our error between the observation and our prediction. Okay, so that was a, was a mouthful, but I assume since you're familiar with linear regression, that made sense. But uh, let me just pause and break it down. Here's the geometrical interpretation. So we are given these pink dots, and we assume, and we know that, you know, we are, our hypothesis is that y is getting generated from this linear function of x. So we try to Describe this data using this red line, which is this linear function of x with the slope v naught and sorry, with the intercept v naught and slope v one. But you know, since we don't know the true values of beta naught and beta one, and we don't know the noise, more uh, importantly, uh, there will always be a mismatch between what we are trying to uh, assume is best describing our data and the true data itself. 
and we call that term error or residual. Residual is, you know, what statistics like to call it, but you can think of this as purely an error term. So simply put, we go back to this equation that our observed response is some simulated or predicted values based on our model plus some error. So our goal now, how do we actually estimate good values of our B0 and B1, which in turn are estimates of beta 0 and beta 1. We say that let me try to find the values of my parameters of this linear model, which are B0 and B1, which minimize some function of my accumulated error across my observations. So mathematically, what that means, one option is we compute the error for each term, which is this you know, blue line in this plot, and the error is simply the observation minus your prediction, where your prediction is coming uh, in this form. And then we can describe a function which is only dependent on our unknown parameters b0 and b1. And the very popularly used function is what is called uh, sum of square residuals or sum of square error. So we are trying to find the values of b0 and b1 which minimize the total error across our n samples of the data. Where each error is yi minus our prediction, where our prediction is of the form b0 minus b1. So s of b0 b1 means that the sum of square residuals of error is a function of b0 and b1. In this equation, we know the observations, we know the predictors, we have to figure out b0 and b1 values which minimize this sum. All good so far? This is what linear regression is. So let me ask you a question here. Um, why do we use the sum of squares? Why not just minimize the sum of residuals? Yes? They may end up to be zero. Okay, so you want to take into account that there may be positive residuals and negative residuals and we don't want to have just the pure sum. So uh, I think that's correct. And it weights the farther ones out more. Very good. So there's another way to think about this is the bigger your residual, the bigger sort of the penalty or error term associated with that because you have a square term. Um, but let me keep, keep sort, of, sort of probing at this point. Why not just use sum of absolute values to fix the problem of the sign? Why square? What is so special about square? The function is differentiable. Very good. Right? So, so to repeat that point, we have many reasons uh, to use uh, sum of square errors. The first could be that, uh, you know, correctly pointed out, we want absolute values, not just, you know, we don't want negative and positive errors to cancel out. Then our uh, estimates of B0 and B1 are going to be skewed for no reason at all. Another good reason is we want to, if a point is like an outlierish point, which is further away from the rest of the data, it should be penalized. That residual term should really like come across. And so if we just look at absolute values uh, or some other metric to uh, make it positive, um, it may not have that desired effect. So that's actually an outcome rather than uh, a reason for square. The primary reason for having a square error is that um, this term, this function of the parameters B0 and B1 can be differentiable compared to an uh, absolute value which has you know, discontinuities when you plot it. So, so what does that mean and why does it matter? Let me just quickly tell you that. Um, so given, let's say, this expression of the error, sum of square errors, which is a function of B0 and B1, my next question is, we want to reduce this error, right? We want to minimize this error. So what we do is, it's not really a question, to minimize this error, we use calculus, so we set the derivative of this function with respect to our parameters equal to zero, right? So, so in the very first lecture, I said you need calculus, so this is why we need that, because a lot of these uh, things I'm not going to explain, as you know this. So, so we have a function which uh, 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 s, which is a function of parameters v0 and v1. We can set the derivatives with respect to each of them equal to zero, and when we solve those equations, when we set them to zero, uh, the result of that soft solution would be the values where this expression, uh, the derivative of this expression is, is zero, and that can cause actually that can correspond to both minimum or maximum. So you can actually verify the second derivative if that's positive, 
then you know this is a this is the legal minimum, right? So so what does that look like mathematically real quick? This is the same expression of the, the sum of squares uh, as dependent on our two parameters. Our model only has two parameters. Uh, when we set the derivatives, and you see the notation again, we are setting partial derivatives because you know, our function has two parameters, it's not just one. Um, so this is what you will end up with. And uh, once again, I think I'm skipping some steps, but again, I want to just make sure everybody's with me. So let's look at the top equation, perhaps. So we want to set this expression, this sum, and we want to take a derivative of that with respect to v naught and set that to zero. So when we take the derivative of this, we'll be two times the same expression, the derivative of yi and v1x will be zero with respect to v0 and we have a negative one as well. But since we are setting that to zero, the negative doesn't matter. So the derivative of this is simply this expression without the square equals zero. Are you with me? Or, okay, right, so, so we can verify that. So what, does, what, what would that be? It's the sum of yi from one to n minus uh, there is nothing in this term which depends upon i, so it's, the sum is simply n. Okay, so minus n times v naught minus again v one times the sum of all x's would be zero, and that's exactly this equation. The stop equation is when we set the derivative with respect to v naught. Similarly, you can convince yourself the bottom equation is when you do that for v one. So now, what have we done? We had an expression which is the sum of square errors. We want to minimize the sum of square errors. We are uh, now, you know, we have two more equations as an outcome of this minimization. Um, just as an aside, these equations in linear regression are sometimes called normal equations. Uh, but now, what important thing is, you have two equations and two unknowns, so you can solve for v naught and v one. And the resulting value of v naught and v one would be the value at which the sum of square errors have a zero slope which could be minima or maxima, but let's just assume it's, it's minima for now. So is this clear? Because this is sort of the, the spine of whatever we have to play the point. Okay? So we did this, and this is called simple linear regression, if you look at the title of this slide. The simple is not because it's you know straightforward in calculus. Simple actually means that uh, x's of this equation are just, there's only one predictor variable, right? We don't have multiple features that are predicting one. We have multiple samples, we have n samples, but they are of the same variable. That's where simple comes from. So the, the next thing is, we do the same thing as before, but I want to introduce this matrix form, because you know, going forth, we'll just start looking at things in this matrix form. It also is very um, desirable because, you know, state space is also matrix form, so there are already some connections there. But let me look at the same problem as before. We have yi, this is our sort of estimation model. So I just stack all the observations into this observation vector y bar. Uh, and then I create a new matrix x such that one, one column of this matrix is all my input values. And I introduce a new column, which is a column of all ones. Why am I doing this? Because I want to represent this equation in a single line for all my data. Okay, so I want to have this form of y as some matrix times the parameter vector now. So if I want that, I want that you know y1 should be v0 plus v1 x1. This allows me to do that by having an explicit column with a value of all ones because they get multiplied by the top parameter each time. And then for each observation, you have an associated vector of the residual effects, right? So um, I don't want you to get confused, x, x is still a single predictor. We don't have multiple predictors, but we just are stacking all the samples together in this matrix form with this additional you know, uh, algebraic manipulation so that we can describe all our, all our observations as some function of the data times the parameter. Okay, so why do we do that? Let me show you the result first and then I'll actually show you how we uh, got there. We do that because if you can uh, simply write the entire data as a function of your parameters, uh, the value of the parameters is given by this expression. Okay? So let me uh, highlight this. 
if this is all our data for n samples and we are interested in doing this derivative with respect to zero and solving it instead of doing that and telling you that the solution would look like this. This is the optimal value which minimizes or uh, these are the intercepts of the linear regression. Okay, so, so how many of you have seen this matrix form before? This is that again on that. Very good. So, so let me just quickly tell you how we got here, but you know, we won't spend too much time on it. Uh, in fact, let me uh, uh, get out of this simple regression into more generalized regression. Um, so we have ordinary least squares where we have the change now where instead of having just one feature vector x1, we actually have k features. So we have x1, x2, xk, and then we have n samples of each of those. Right? So it's the generalization now is that your predictor is, the true term is, it's multivariate. Right? You, have multi you have multiple predictors instead of just a single predictor. But all of this story still holds. We can still write the entire data of y, which is just a set of n observations. I guess here is my first notational error. I've been using small y for observation, but all of a sudden this is capital Y. Um, but we want to write y as some uh, data matrix x, which is simply, you know, all of the data plus this special column for the intercept, uh, times the parameter vector, so you have, you know, um, there's a, I think there's an error here as well, so let's make sure the, what are these n's and k's, you have n samples, and you have k predictors, so you should have k plus 1 parameters. Right, so this, this is actually a typo. This should be beta k plus 1. Because we have one beta for each of the x's and beta naught, which has become beta 1 all of a sudden uh, for the 1. Okay? So the point is we want to write all of our data in the same form. Why did we do that? Because now we can say that the error is going to be y minus this expression, x times beta. Right? Because y is x beta plus e. So what is d? It's y minus x beta. So what is the sum of squared errors now? In this, you know, uh, if we go back, just to make sure, we had a vector of error for each of these rows, which is the same vector. So the sum of squared errors in um, a vector format, uh, sort of uh, representation, can be just written as the uh, error transpose times the error itself. That's the same as the square. The square of a vector is the transpose times the vector itself. So we have the sum of squared residuals as E transpose E, but what is E itself? It's y minus x beta. So we can actually compute this expression that E transpose E is this error transpose the error itself. There's nothing but matrix algebra. And I've shown all the steps, so uh, you know I can convince you again. Let's do it quickly. When you take a transpose of something, uh, you have to sort of flip it around. Uh, and so uh, we have we'll have a term which is y transpose y, so that's this first term. Then we we'll have a term which is beta hat transpose x hat transpose y, which is this term with the minus sign. Um, and you know you have the same term when this y gets multiplied here, and when these two terms get multiplied, you get this last term. So, uh, is everyone still with me so far? Because I'm just sort of telling you where that magic formula of uh, B estimate came from. Uh, and here again, you know, my bad that I'm just jumping around with betas and B, but I hope it's clear. So, we have this expression. The observation is this expression, beta uh, transpose x transpose y, would actually compute to be a scalar. Okay, if you go back and convince yourself, oh, I'm going forward. If you go back and convince yourself, beta transpose x transpose y. So 1 into uh, something which is 1 by k plus 1 multiplied by 1 by, multiplied by k plus 1 times n would be 1 by n, multiplied by n by 1 would be 1 by 1. So that transpose, uh, that, that this term would be a scalar. So is this term, so we can combine them into a single term without the order of the transpose really matter. So now you have a sum of the squared errors as a function of x and y, which you know, and a function of beta, which you don't know. So what's our next step? We want to do what with the sum of the squared errors? We don't just minimize it with respect to beta, which we don't know. So let me just explicitly show you that. So here we can now in matrix form, 
just minimize all of this with respect to beta hat. So this term doesn't matter. This term will evaluate to minus 2x prime y. And then this term is like a b squared term, so it will have plus 2 times this expression times beta itself. And this is, when set to 0, will give rise to this equation, which is the same equation as before, only the difference is that I'm using beta instead of b. So what have we really done? This is very powerful, right? This is what it is saying. Let's say you have n observations of y. Each of y depends linearly on k predictors. So you have k observation of predictors, or you have n observations for each of the k predictors as well. So our goal is to find these k plus 1 parameters which best describe each of the y as a function of the x's. And what this is telling you is, you don't have to take any derivative of anything as long as this, look at this first part, right? So this part is only a property of your predictors, x transpose x. is a symmetrical matrix which just depends upon your data of the predictors. If that quantity, if this matrix is invertible, then you can compute the optimal value of the parameters just in a single shot as a function of the data. And this is what linear regression is. Okay, so that's simmer in for a few seconds and if you have questions, let me know. But what we have done is we've seen a linear, simple linear regression with a single predictor and how it generalizes to this matrix form where the, the formal way of saying this is we now have a closed form expression. What is a closed form expression? You can directly analytically compute the parameters of your regression model, the best estimates of the true para unknown parameters simply by calculating this uh, vector. Okay? Okay, so, so this is all what you may have seen already. Um, let me try to present a slightly different interpretation of the same thing. Right, so, um, so you know, we think of linear models as models where y is a linear function of the x's, and that's completely correct. However, you can also question, and, and I think we've sort of discussed this a little bit uh, in state space modeling, that how does y depend upon the beta or the b's or the parameters of the model itself? Right? That's a valid question to ask. And so what we observe is that in linear models, this derivative or this rate of change of y with respect to the parameters, this will always be independent of the parameters itself. This will not depend upon the parameter itself. This quantity, by the way, the rate of change of the output with respect to the parameter is called the sensitivity of the model. And the sort of intuition behind this, let's say I have a already identified a linear model. I can ask, how would the output change if my estimate of beta were to increase or decrease? So I'm not really concerned with how the predictors influence my output, I'm concerned with how my own model parameters influence my output. Or how sensitive is the change in the output to the change in my parameters, which is this quantity. So a property of linear models is also that the sensitivities of the output are not a function of the model parameters. And that's true for you know a simple linear regression where both of the sensitivities are either constant or do not depend upon the parameter itself. So this may have may have been you know an interpretation you haven't seen before. And geometrically, what is happening is this linear model what it allows us to do. So recall you know our, our sum of square uh, sum of square error is a function of the parameter. Let's say we have two parameters b1, b2, or b0, b1. Um, because of the linear, linearity of the sensitivity um, to the parameters, the sum of squared errors can be interpreted geometrically as being an uh, equation of a, of a parabola or a parabola because you have more than one parameters. Right? So you can again, if you want, I don't want to go back too many slides, but we can even see that here. Right? So we have y observe minus something which is linear in v0 and v1. So error is nothing but this term multiplied by this term itself. So you will get square terms in B0, B1. You've actually seen that just a few slides ago. So that's the equation of a parabola, right? The volume, which is the shape of a parabola. Um, so let me show you what is going on in this picture, by the way. So here we have two parameters, B1 and B2, of our linear regression. The vertical axis is the sum of the squares. 
which is this paraboloid volume. And what you have, what I'm showing here is something called the level sets of a function. So this is something you may not have heard before, so let me define it. What each of these contours in the 2D plane of B2, B1 are telling me is that the value of the function being evaluated is constant along points on this line. Okay, so you can visually see that, you know, the, if we have a parabola, we, we can have this elliptical circumference sort of a boundary of the parabola where this function is evaluating to the same value uh, for any given values of b2, b1, right? So let's look at this middle one here. No matter where you are on this ellipse, the value of sb is the same. Does everybody agree with that or is this clear? And so if this is the same, how do you represent a three-dimensional function in 2D? You use a trick which is called level sets. So you can think of this level set as being a projection from a 3D to a 2D plane of any function. And it's the easiest to understand when your function is just a parabola. Right? So another property of, of linear models, because of the same behavior of you know this independence on sensitivity, is that the level sets of a linear model or the sum of square errors, they are ellipses always. Okay, so this is this is a geometric interpretation of linear regression, which we may not have spent too much time. And the final sort of take-home message for linear regression is that because we have a closed-form solution, we can get to the what is the point which minimizes the sum of squared errors? It's this point which has the lowest squared error, right? Because this is a parabola, or you can think of it as the center of this. Uh, contoured projection of the function. And the big thing about having a closed form solution is that you can get to the optimal uh, values of B1 and B2 in a single shot. Right? You have one step, essentially one computation to do to get to the minimum. And again, I want to emphasize this because this is not going to be true for nonlinear models. That's why I'm showing you these things. So let me pause here again if you want to have any clarifications or yeah, questions on what level sets are like. Okay, so any questions? No? Good. So, so no surprises that in nonlinear models, the sensitivities will be a function of the parameters themselves. Right? So before you can go into the details of this. Just convince yourself on your submission, right? So one of the questions was, can you write the elements of A, B, C, D matrices in your state space model as a function of the uh, RC or the UC values? And so, just go back to your own solution. Each of those elements is some 1 over RC or R1 minus R2 by C or U1 minus, something like that. It's a nonlinear dependence. So if you take the derivative of that with respect to you know, one of the, the parameters, you won't be left with the term, which also depends on another parameter. Right? So, so the elements of A, B, C, D are highly actually nonlinear in our building model um, in the parameter space theta, where theta is nothing but the vector of all RC values of the network. Right? So, and we will explicitly see why this is important, why. Um, I hope it's clear that even before we should we see the mathematical sort of uh, version of this same phenomena, uh, because you just did this homework. The elements of A, B, C, D are nonlinear functions of the parameters. So therefore, we need nonlinear estimation. Right? So all of this monologue was to get to this point, of the real sort of uh, new thing that we want to learn. Um, how do we do nonlinear estimation? Why is it a hard problem? And more importantly, we don't have those form solutions for nonlinear estimates. We have to do some kind of a iterated algorithm. So let me set up the problem first before I jump into some examples. So suppose again we have collected some data of an output or a response variable y, and we have n observations of y. And correspondingly, we have some predictors or features which are the x's. Right? So, so don't think of x's as the states again. This is back again into the general 
framework. So we have P features or K features, doesn't matter. We have some multivariate predictors of Y. And then we also have N observations of each of those. So the difference between the linear and nonlinear uh, setup is going to be that for some possible values of the parameters, and let's say we have Q parameters, uh, which are these thetas, we can define a general function which is going to only be a function of our unknowns, which is the thetas of our model, as the observation minus our prediction. So everything is still the same as linear regression so far. Right? We are still computing the sum of squared errors between y and y prime, where y prime, our own prediction, is some function which is possibly nonlinear of the data x or the predictors and some value of the parameters itself. Okay, so so uh, the parallel sort of analogy to keep that alive, to predict the temperature or output y from your state space model, you need to know the inputs, the states, and you also need to have some value of the RC. Without a value of the RC, there is no prediction. That's what this is saying, right? So we can generate y prime using x conditioned on the fact that we have some estimate of the parameter. Uh, explicitly y hat is this expression in this bracket this one here. This is just a very high level general discussion. So this is the formulation of a generalized you know, least square for any function f. f could be linear in the case of simple linear regression. And so the least square estimates are the ones which minimize this function. So no surprises there. Uh, so the problem is that you have seen, you know, when you try to minimize this expression, we have to take the derivative of this sum of squared terms with respect to each of the parameters. And in doing so, we will have some terms which will involve partial derivative of this function itself with respect to the parameters. So we will encounter these sensitivity terms while we are trying to minimize this function. And these terms would be highly nonlinear because the sensitivity will itself be some function of another parameter. So we will not be able to obtain based on how complicated f is for most nonlinear functions you cannot obtain a closed form solution that you can just solve an equation and get a single equation to describe what the minimum is and the reason for that is that the, the sensitivity of these nonlinear functions in parameter space uh, depends upon the parameter itself right so so again to make it super clear our function is LTI. We are linear time invariant. The linearity is in, in that uh, LTI sort of name calling is because our function is linear in the state and the input. And we've you know, seen this many times uh, before, so I won't uh, repeat that. But our function is nonlinear when it comes to how the output or the states depend upon parameters. Right? So the A theta, B theta, C theta, which are functions of theta, uh, they're nonlinear. And the connection between what we have been doing and the generalized framework is using our state space model, we have to write an expression of the output of our model as a function of the state input and the vector theta. If you have this expression, then there are some algorithms that will minimize this expression. Okay, so we are doing the same thing, we are doing least squares, uh, and this is least square regression, but it's just nonlinear. So we need a expression, a mathematical expression to compute our predictions or our estimates of y to minimize the residual y observed minus estimate, uh, and that's the hard part. How do we get this sort of expression, which is a function of the parameters uh, of the model? And so, in the next sort of uh, five to ten minutes, I'm going to show you that, and then. Time permitting, you can see if you want to end early or keep going into the algorithms, how we solve them as well. It's interesting when I say time permitting, everybody looks at them. Okay, so, so here's the question, right? This is, this is for all the chips. How can we compute the sum of squared errors for our state space model, right? This, enough of the generalized stuff. Let's actually get to how this uh, you know, relates to anything of what we have been doing for the previous two weeks. So here's an idea. I'll just walk through it and then you know we can pause for questions if there's any um, doubts or clarifications. This is our this is first of all the same format of the model that you have just submitted today. 
where I am explicitly showing you things which take the time, or uh, if you discretize the model at uniform times, that's k. Uh, so we are explicitly showing that the ABCD matrices don't vary with time, but they are a function of the parameters of your model, the RC values. So let's consider this, uh, this model. What we can say is that at time zero, we are given the measurement of our initial state. So we know what the surface temperatures of the building the zone are and what the zone temperature is. That's the states of your model, right? All the, all the node temperatures in the RC temperature. So let's say we are given X naught in the general sense. And we are also given an observation of the inputs that we measure. Right? So I measure solar, whatnot, outside temperature. I measure everything for n steps. And I'm just given the initial state, and I have a model structure. Well, first of all, before we even do anything, we can say that the output according to our model is C times X0 plus D times U0 because of our output equation. So we have our value of Y0 as a function of the initial state and the initial input. Actually, since in the building model B is zero, no surprises there, but uh, it's just a function of the initial state. So that's good. What can we do with this information? Remember, we are still at time zero. We haven't really progressed that. At time zero again, I can say, what is x1? x1 is this expression, right? x1 is a times x0 plus b times input at time one. And I told you we are given the, say, the prediction of, we are given the n inputs. We've already measured that. So we're trying to find the values of, we're trying to find that function y, which depends upon x use and the thetas of our, of our model. Uh, so this equation is derived from our you know, actual model, x k plus 1 equals ax plus bu. So if we can compute x1, then we can also compute y1 at time 0. There's no additional information here. y1 is c times x1 plus d times u1, but x1 is this expression, so I can substitute the value of x1 into this output equation, and I will get y1 is a function of the initial state uh, and the first input. Okay? So let's keep going. What is x2? x2 is ax1 plus bu2. And y2 Accord, I'm sorry, so before we do that, again, x1 is this expression that we previously computed. So x2 really is also a function of the initial state and the inputs. In fact, let me pause this and make a hyperlink to something we discussed in the very first. What is a state? A state allows you to estimate the outputs of the model given the initial state and the inputs. This is what is happening here. Yeah, we are estimating the outputs of a model given the initial state and inputs and inputs. So x2 is also this expression, and let me also make a side remark. This story only holds if we assume our model has no noise. Okay? If there's noise terms, we have to account for that in some complex ways, but that's not the that's a like tangential discussion. So x2 is this expression. So now y2 is c times x2 plus d times u2. So you no points for guessing what's next. We will substitute the value of x2 uh, using what we have calculated before. So y2 becomes this long expression, but it only depends upon x0, u1, u2, uh, uh, and that's it. So you can see where I'm going with this. If I had n observations of y at time 0, or I define, you know, I'm looking at these n observations, and this is the first one. I am slowly creating my estimates of y for each of those n observations because I want to compute a function or a vector of all estimates, n estimates of y as a function of my initial state, the inputs, and the parameters. So all these you know, messy looking matrices are just multiplications of the ABCD which are a function of the RC values. And not only that, a itself, the elements of A itself are nonlinear in RC. We are now further multiplying A with itself and with C, this is becoming highly nonlinear. Right? Y2 is very, very nonlinear in the parameter space. 
But what we can do is, if you look at, there's a trend, right? So y0 is c times x0, y1 is c a times x0, y2 is c a times square x0. And similarly, you can find the trend for the input term. So we can write n predictions of our model from 0 to n minus 1 as some matrix times the initial state plus another matrix times all the inputs. Where this matrix O and matrix T will further depend upon the ABC. Right? So this is just a more notational uh, sort of uh, gravity over here. So for a given estimate of RC values, you can now predict what your model will produce as n predictions of the output. So this function is a function that we will use for the sum of square errors. And it's deterministic because we assume there is no numbers. So question on this. Now you maybe have the first sense of why state space is pretty powerful. Right? Now it makes all sense. Earlier it was just a notational convenience and all these things about, oh, we are good in solving matrix operations, but what are we solving? We are solving these kind of nonlinear least stress problems. And we are able to progress the output at any given time, given some you know, history or, or, or even in some cases the fourth. And you'll see in MPC, you will use the same trick, but I don't want to uh, point that out yet. Okay, so we can now define this, right? We have a sum of squared errors, which will be only a function of theta. Where is theta in this equation? It's embedded deep, deep in the O and the T matrices. And so if we can define it, we can minimize this. Um, so by the way, just for completeness, this is the O and the T matrix. And this is the form of that matrix. O is not a vector, even though it looks, you know, it's only have a one single column. C itself is a matrix, and C times A is also a matrix. So this is a big matrix. Anyone knows what the name of the O matrix is? It's not important, but has anyone encountered in your system that knows what this is? The third controllability. No. What is the reward of that? Observability. Yes. So O is called the observability matrix for a LTI system. Okay, and it has some special properties, which you know, this was a linear systems course, we will go deep into. So we are, we are mostly looking at parameter estimation. Cool. So now we have everything we need to define the expression, but there is still a problem. And let me show what the problem is, and then you know we can see uh, what we want to do next, because the next part is again quite uh, mathematically intensive. So in the general form, we can say that, and again I apologize, I'm changing locations again. So you know we are given inputs u of k, the initial state for n steps or n observations of this, and so I'm denoting this entire set by uh, the set C on N denotes how many samples we have in this set. Okay, it's just a weak letter notation. So what we want to compute is the estimate of the parameters for these N which describe this N uh, samples um, such that so th this estimate is a function of our data again which is consistent with the you know, simple linear regression. So in particular we want to minimize the sum of squared errors, which is a function of theta and something that we know. Right? So this quantity is fully known to us, the z of that. In, uh, in addition, we can have a constraint that your estimate of theta should be from some uh, you know, global set. Right? So what, what does that mean? It means that the capacitance of the zone here cannot be infinite. Right, so it has to have some meaningful range for my parameters to choose from. The thing I'm getting at is, which we also saw in the linear regression uh, um, example is, parameter estimation is basically a search problem. Right? You are given a function, the sum of squared errors, which depends upon parameters. We've seen a two-dimensional example of that, but you can have, say, k parameters, and you have this k-dimensional sum of squared error function uh, and we are trying to find this saddle point or the minimization of this 
function that could be nonlinear in this k-dimensional space, right? And what we are saying with this argument is that the search space is finite. Okay? You can just choose any value to minimize this. So given this, the sum of squared errors is this expression, you know, error which is also a function of theta transpose error, um, where error itself is measured minus predicted. And we have just seen how we can express the prediction from our state space as a, as a function of theta. Okay, so the, the next question is how do you actually solve this minimization if S is this complicated nonlinear function of theta? And so this is where the, the um, main part of this uh, uh, parameter discussion segues into. We are going to look at nonlinear least squares. So we are still doing least squares, but it's nonlinear. And in particular, we are going to look at three different algorithms called steepest descent, Gauss Newton, and Leavenberg Marquette. Um, you may have heard about at least the first one, I'm assuming, but you may not know all of the second or third one, especially the third one is, uh, is not commonly uh, you know, taught in sort of, uh, basic courses. But we will both understand what how these algorithms work, and uh, you will actually use in a week or 10 days time this algorithm to estimate the parameters of the RC model that we submitted. Uh, so let me just warm that problem up and we can end a little bit early after that. So, so the, the main common thread across all these um, algorithms for nonlinear estimation is that they are iterative. And why are they iterative? Because once again, the we cannot have a closed form solution for this nonlinear sum of squared error minimization because of the sensitivity problem. Right? So, so what they, the common thing to all of these algorithms is that uh, they are iterative, it's an iterative process. So we always begin with some estimate for what these parameters could be, which is where your worksheet three comes in. You will use the IDF5 energy plus to estimate or begin the first guess of this process. That's what really is happening in worksheet 3. But we begin with a guess of what these parameters are. Why are we guessing? Because uh, if we don't need a picture, you can just visualize this. You have a k-dimensional parameter space. Uh, the sum of squares is a nonlinear function in this space. So we have to start our search at some point. Right? We need a, it could be a random point as well. Some algorithms actually just randomly initialize the parameters. And in many cases, that actually performs better than an educated guess. But since our model is a physics-based model, we have a pretty good idea what this region of search is, uh, you know, what's a good starting point, what's a good guess. So the RC values are not just pulled out of thin air, they represent some physical attributes. So if we can guess a good starting point, then we can just tell these algorithms to evaluate the sum of squared at that point, and based on you know some property of the function itself, they will decide how to update the value of the parameter automatically until they converge to a value which minimizes the sum of squared errors. Okay, so uh, so there's essentially a two-step process. There's an initial estimate, and then it iteratively finds better estimates to converge to some minimum, global minimum or local minimum. Uh, so let me just introduce steepest descent, and I promise I will end in another two or three slides. So how is, because I want you to not just look at the names, but figure out how do they do this step, right? How do they iteratively find better estimates, which is, seems to be the entire key to why this would work in the first place. So the key idea is steepest descent, and I won't read this, you know, these slides are, are always available, but the key intuition is that first we have an initial guess, we evaluate the sum of squares, at that initial point, then we calculate the slope of this sum of squared function at that point, and we will update our parameters in the direction in this k-dimensional space, which has the steepest or the highest slope and minimizes the error. That's where the name steepest descent also comes in. Right? It moves, the steepest descent moves from the point along the direction of the steepest descent. And descent is nothing but computing the slope of a function at any point. Right? So how, how does that work? It uses you know uh, uh, 
if you just come, well, so if we, let me make it clear, right? So when we have the expression of y as a function of the parameters that's nonlinear, we cannot have a closed form solution, but given some guess of the parameters, given the values of the RC, you can compute the derivative, right? So the derivative is a, and I said the sensitivity of the, of the output is going to depend upon the parameters themselves. That is still true, but if you have an estimate of the value of the parameter, you can at least compute the numerical value of the slope or the sensitivity. And this is a very common idea that you have a function which is very, very nonlinear. We actually used this way back when we had this trick of linearization. You had a nonlinear function, but at any point, you can approximate it with a linear slope or a linear function. So here you have this nonlinear sum of squares, and at any point in the parameter space, you can compute the slope, the steepest slope in this parametric space, and that is what is used. The magnitude of that slope is what is used to update the parameters. Right, so visually, and I will repeat this next time, but I just want to show you that, let's say you know this is more or less a quadratic function, but not quite. Right? There's some sort of weird skewness um, uh, towards the left side, uh, or it is more or less quadratic. You can even use that, it doesn't matter. The y-axis is the sum of squares for this two parameters, b1 and b2, or x1 and x2. Uh, and so you start with an initial guess, which is say x0, where the value of the sum of square is the maximum possible, which is 200. So in our 2D view, this outermost circle is the level set of this. Right? So x0 could be somewhere here. Then you compute the slope of this um, paraboloid at x0, and you find the direction in this two-dimensional space which has the maximum slope and which reduces the sum of square area. So you move greedily towards that direction. And you continue to move around this you know, uh, train down into the lowest point in this value. And so visually what is happening is you have an initial guess, you move to some level set with a reduced error, you move to another level set with a reduced error, so on and so forth until you get to say the minima at this point. So the property of steepest descent is it uses the magnitude of this derivative to compute how far it has to move. That's why it's called steepest descent, right? So, so here's another visualization that's actually even better. Because you can see the both 3D function, you have to kind of get into this dark navy blue uh, region of this curve, and you start from x naught. And so you can actually see uh, a limitation of steepest descent here as well, that the closer you are to the true minimum, the smaller your descent increments are going to be. So it has a limitation that it actually takes a very long time for steepest descent to converge to um, some sort of a minimum property. So in the next lecture, we will pick up from here, and essentially, you know, this is uh, the, the mathematical form of that. You have a parameter estimate k. You update your parameters by a magnitude which is equivalent to the gradient of the sum of squared errors um, at this previous value of k. So in the next lecture, I will show you uh, in more detail how this works, why does this work, and what are the limitations and modifications which will lead us to this uh, very good algorithm called Levenberg Maffet for nonlinear parameter estimation. I will also show you in the next lecture the solution set or the reference solution set for this assignment. Uh, and I will also show you uh, sort of a preview of what is the function in MATLAB that would do all of this for us at the end of the day. You will not write your own optimization as well. So, so let's stop here and then we can continue next week.